watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. everybody online. I hope you guys are doing well. Everybody in here, you doing all right? You guys are, see you're, I don't want to say that your excitement is better than 830. I just think you got a little more sleep than 830. Uh, very excited to be with you guys. That is right. Keep yelling at me. I'm into it. And so we're rowdy today. I like it. Uh, we're continuing our series, Stand Firm. We started this a few weeks ago where we're walking through in the New Testament, the Bible's broken up into Old New Testament. In the New Testament of the Bible, there's these books, First and Second Peter. And the books basically, in an umbrella kind of way, talk about how you and I will encounter all sorts of things. And when we want to say and believe and live out that God is the one that we're going to follow, you'll encounter things where you go... Uh, do I want to turn this way and trust you and have faith and all of these things? Or when we encounter suffering and hurt and trials, we're just going to go, yeah, that's going to be a no-go for me. I'm going to go this way and sometimes move in the fear that we have, move in our own way, feeling that we know better than God does. And I totally understand that. And as we've walked through the last few weeks, we've said, I get it. Me too. Every single one of us have had moments, whether we're very close to God or whether we're still searching, skeptical, and have questions, where we've encountered something and we have that crossroads dilemma, which way do I go? And we wanted to be able, over the course of the summer, because we know people's schedules, moving around, you know, vacations, all sorts of things, how can you and I learn to stand firm in how God designed us, how he made us, and that we can follow him in everything that we do because that is difficult. And what I know here this morning with the short time that we have is that there's some of us who we came in and we're like, yay, rah, 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 Jesus, but our heads are swimming with other stuff, details, the week, other things going on. For some of us, we walked in, we go, man, I don't even want to be here. Somebody made me come here and I'm just here because lunch is later and I have to go through this to get to lunch. And I get it. For some of you, you're like, I'm not even getting up out of bed. I'm just going to watch them online and I'm not even sure if I like these guys at all. And we're still glad you guys are watching and here. But I know that there's roadblocks for every one of us for what we're about to encounter with the 20 plus minutes that we learn together. And so I want to pray for all of us that no matter where we're at, online or here, no matter where we find ourselves on the spectrum of faith, that we'll trust that God can do something that maybe we never anticipated. So I'd love it if you guys would pray with me. God, today, no matter who we are, where we find ourselves, we want to trust you. The fact that we're tuning in online or here in this room means that we, at the very least, believe that there could be something to you in the search for the divine in your son, Jesus. And so today, any roadblocks that we have, whether it's our schedules or our, our, our shortcomings or our past with church and God and faith, anything that has been built up, God, we pray today that you would tear those things down, that you would give us the opportunity to hear you with fresh ears, to be able to see clearly, and to more than that, to push us to respond in taking a step closer to Jesus today. God, we affirm all of your promises 
And we celebrate this morning, and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray together. Amen. This week, I get the opportunity to leave with our third through sixth graders to go to camp for the whole week. You can pray for me. Because if you're like, nah, like that's how I used to be. I used to be like, nope, not going to do it. Even when I had like little, little kids, I'm like, I'm not going to hang around there. But it is a blast. It is absolutely, it's a phenomenal week. We get to go, they get to stay on a college campus and in the dorm rooms that they call their apartments. It's not an apartment. But they get to do that. They get to have fun and we learn about God and they explore their faith and they get into worship sessions. And I see some of you guys like, today you guys were singing. You did pretty well. It was exciting to see. But like there, there are some times where we're just like, I love Jesus. Mumble. These kids are nothing like that. They are screaming and shouting, and it looks like every single one's having a seizure, but they're not. Like, they just don't know how to control their bodies, and like, they are dancing, having fun. It is so cool to watch. And it's it puts things into perspective that kind of just uh, beautiful, untainted joy of God and of faith. But there are moments during the week where you go, wow, all that's amazing, and they're learning, and they're exploring that, whatever. There's a flip side of that. They're still kids. And so still being kids, they're going to make decisions that are not so smart, or what I call dumb choices. And so they will do things because they're kids, and it's age appropriate, and I understand that. In my very first year, I was thinking back, I've been doing this for a long time, going with these kids. In my very first year, I experienced this. I was in charge of this large group of boys. We take them to the college dorms, they're ah, whatever, and there are a couple other male leaders there. And our thing is, you got to start off the week, especially with young boys, you got to drop the hammer and drop it quick. Because if you don't drop the hammer and set the standard, then they're going to run over you the entire week. And so we drop the hammer, and so like in two minutes, we explain the rules and whatever, and all of them are like, I think I went to boot camp. Like they're, they look a little terrified, but we release that a little bit. Go, hey, but listen, guys, here's the deal. We give them the caveat. We say, if you guys know how to like follow the rules, we're going to have a blast. We're going to have fun. Here's the deal. And they all like lean in like, we're about to get granted the keys to the kingdom. And I said, here's the deal. If you listen to your leaders, when it's lights out, you, you don't have to turn the lights out. You can stay up as late as you want. And they all, like, pure bedlam erupted. They're just going crazy, like, yay! Yeah, these leaders are the best! And we're like, but you have to obey the rules. And I don't want to hear you, no matter how late you stay up. If I hear you, it's going to go bad. So we go through the whole day. They're all wiped out, or so I think. And I said, you can stay up in your room as late as you want. So for some of you parents that are sending your kids this year, you're like, oh my gosh, it'll, be, you know, it'll work out. And so we let them stay up and I go back and there's an adult at each end of the hallway so they can't like run off and do something crazy. And I'm in my room and I lay down and I can hear absolutely nothing because that's how it should be if you run a tight ship. And so we, I hear nothing and I lay down like the sweet sound of crash and I hear and I'm like I thought somebody had like driven a car through the dorm wall we're on the first floor and I'm like <gasps> and so we run out I think we were in one, uh, South Carolina at the time at a school in this year and so we're ru I run out and I run down the hallway and I open up the door here's the deal I had said that you can stay up as late as you want without making noise in your room all of the boys had gathered for a meeting of the minds in the same room. But they didn't stop there. They also decided they were going to bring every piece of luggage they owned into the same room and then play luggage Jenga. Because who wouldn't want at 11.45 to play luggage Jenga? I didn't tell them this in the moment, but that's an awesome idea. <laughs> totally, totally appropriate in my mind. They didn't need to know that. I was livid. What is going on in here? And all of them, like there, you hear the crash, and then I come in, and all of them just stop. If we don't move, he can't see us. <laughs> 
and I, they all just stop. And I'm like, what is going on in here? And they all immediately start blaming the other kids because none of them, it's their fault. Surely they have all become victim to someone else's anger and plot. And so I'm like, hey, listen, you're all in trouble. And as I'm like going, all right, you're not going to be able to stay up the rest of the week. I do these rules. You're going to take advantage of my generosity. No, we're not. Uh, opens the door across the hall and two little guys come out rubbing their eyes. What's going on out here? And it, in the moment, I feel bad for them. And to me, they're like, what is... And they look in and one of the other guys go, you were just in here. You were just in here. And I'm like, that would have been me. What's... What's happening? I don't even know. And so they walk out, and they're like, we don't know. They're yelling at me. I said, but they, I said, when I came in, they were not here. So they clearly made a better choice than the rest of you. <laughs> so you guys cannot stay up the rest of the week. But these guys, and the whole rest of the group is like, what? What? And they're freaking out. And I said, they can stay up. You guys cannot get to breakfast the next morning. One of the other kids, he's sitting at the table eating his cereal. Just like, if I, if looks could kill, I would not be here this morning. He's just burning and <laughs> eating it, just aggressive, like animal from Muppets. <laughs> and he's just eating it, and I'm like, oh, a little terrified. And he goes, I can't believe. And he starts moving his head. If he had moved it anymore, it would have broke off, just snapped right off. I can't believe you let them. I said, they made a choice. I said, I wasn't there for what happened. Oh, yeah, you weren't there. You should have seen it. Well, and, he's like, and I said, they weren't in there, and you were, well, it was my room. And I was like, life choices, man. Like you, we moved through the whole thing. And I said, when you choose to do the wrong thing, there's repercussions for your actions. And he like, the rest of the week, and we had this great conversation with the guys. I ended up letting them stay up because I'm gracious because I want to be like Jesus. And so we, and we ended up doing, but, but we watched this opportunity that happened about every single one of us, and this happens, this does not stop when we become adults. We don't become adults and begin to exercise our movement in faith and go, all of a sudden, I am very proper, and everything that I choose to do will always be in line with Jesus because I'm an adult. No, I, I know that is not the case. I have sat with the vast majority of you, and I know that's not the case. I know that's not the case in my life because I continue to mess up and make mistakes and fall short. And so what is it when we go get into these moments that makes us want to do something other than what God desires for us? And even more so, what is it that we think that somehow, some way, that if we continue living like that, that there aren't repercussions for that? You know, everything else in life, if you show up late enough at work, you're going to get fired. If you don't show your spouse the honor, love, and treatment that they deserve, you may wake up one day and they will say, I no longer want to be with you. I don't want to, I don't want to do this anymore. If you show your kid absolutely zero attention, they will eventually go off the rails because they'll go find it someplace else. See, there's repercussions for every one of our actions, which is why we started this series talking about standing firm. And if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to turn over. We were in 1 Peter the last few weeks. We're going to be in 2 Peter. It's in the New Testament of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we give them away for free. And so for those of you guys who are here live this morning, you could stop by in the lobby, grab a brand new Bible. There's no catch. If you're more digitally inclined and for you guys online, head over to ForefrontChurch.info. Swipe over a couple times there till you get to the Notes tab. Click on that and all the notes that we have today to follow along. Because I know if you're anything like me and others that I know, like it's hard to sometimes just keep with every track and it's all right there for you to follow along. In this passage, I want to I wanna warn you. We maybe start with a little bit of a warning. You see, today's message will be hopeful, but we have to kind of look at the fact that there's repercussions for our actions and what are those? You see, even this morning when my wife got to church here, I got here early and she came. So, well, you know, explain one of our daughters wasn't doing the best. And I explained to her, I said, for real, dude, daddy. Like she didn't even want to hear 
the fact that like there may be disappointment, that there may be some repercussions for actions. We don't like that as adults either. But to get to the good news, we have to kind of hear about some of the things that aren't so great. And so I want you to not only buckle up, but to to kind of ride along with me. I don't want you to kind of trail off in this. As we look at what exactly would be the repercussions of continuing to choose our own way instead of following God. And as we get through this passage, the good news is we're going to see how can you and I make very wise choices to get to the other side of that, to go, man, my life is healthy. I don't always do everything right, but man, I am honoring God. Even when I fall short, I get back up and I keep choosing him. And so it's over in 2 Peter, starting in verse 4 and following. Now, I want to warn you, this is heavy stuff. You might be like, eh. like if you claim faith, you might think, oh, I'm good. Everything's fine. I want to warn you, I meet a lot of people who claim faith who don't actually live it. Or we would hear, Thrace, if you're going to talk the talk, you need to walk the walk. And so if you don't claim faith this morning, you're angry with God, you're angry with church, I want to let you know there's such good news and all of us are in the same boat. Everyone's made mistakes, all have fallen short, but there's grace on the other side. But what happens when we just keep choosing the wrong thing? Starting in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and following. It says, For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell in the glowing pits of darkness where they are being held into the day of judgment. I told you, it's going to be dark for a second. It's going to get better on the other side. Here we go, verse 5. And God did not spare the ancient world, except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. I want to pause here. If you are someone who goes, man, I'm not sure about the Bible. I, I don't know about some of these accounts that take place. For instance, in the Old Testament, there's an account of this guy, and he ends up getting swallowed by a large fish. It doesn't say which kind. We assume that it's a whale and whatever, and he spent a few days in there. Things didn't go very well for him. You might be like, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about a big boat and a flood. I want to let you know, while we at Forefront Church believe the Bible and we believe the accounts that took place, I want to give you a pass. I want to give you a chance to exit off of these because I don't want these accounts that are noted to get you wrapped up in that and miss the big idea that God wants for you. Because in each of these instances, what we see is a choice to either choose to honor God or to do it our own way. And if we do it our own way enough, what are the repercussions of that? That doesn't mean when you follow God that you're a robot, but that you trust him even when it's sometimes hard. He continues on. It says, later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah that turned them into heaps of ashes. He made an example of what will happen to ungodly people. But God rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality and wicked people around him. Listen to verse 8. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day to day. This, so in this moment, Lot is lamenting about the fact he sees this. He was a person who lived in the city. He loved his city, but he saw these things that were going on, and it broke his heart, and it wraps up. So see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of judgment. That's a big theological way of saying those, every single person, day after day after day, gets met with choices. And God knows the heart of man. You don't. So whether somebody shows up one time to church or 800 times, that is not the measure of whether or not they love Jesus. Because I've met people who have gone, walked into church one time who love God much deeper than the person that's there every day and checks it off their star chart of these moments. And so how do we look and say, all right, God, how do I stand firm? And what's the state of my being in following you or not following you because it seems like nobody else can know but you. And so if you don't get anything else, my prayer is that you would get this. This is our big idea for today, that God is in control. He knows the heart and mind of every single person. Now, can we see the movement of that in people's lives? Sure. If we watch and look at someone's life, we can see, you know what? There's something different about you in the way that you love, the way that you give hope, the way that you help other people, that you're selfless, we can see that. 
you can see what we would call, and the Bible talks about, the fruit of people's lives. And so we're going to get into a little bit of that. But God is in control and knows everybody. But here's the question that we're going to look at today. In light of that, making choices for God or for ourselves, what would God say is the state of your heart and mind? You probably, when you were rolling out of bed, didn't think that was the question you would be met with today. What, what is the state? What, if God were to peer in and give a glimpse, I'm not saying to get up and we're going to march everybody up here and like, all right, John, tell us the state of your heart and mind. That, God, that would be terrifying. I wouldn't even want to do that because I know I fall short. But if God were to open up and look in, what is the state of your heart? What is the state of your thoughts and the way that you live? You see, what I've realized is I've looked at this and the, this concept of standing firm is, well, in the United States especially, most people don't lead their life. They accept their life. Most people that I encounter, they just are reactive to what takes place in their life rather than proactive in what's taking place. God says, I want you to care for others. And you go, yeah, well, I'll just react to the moments that, that kind of just happened to me. He goes, well, I, I want you, I know there's people that are hurtful. I've called you to love your neighbor, I've called you to love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. And we go, uh-uh. I'm not any part of that. You go do good to those who hate me. I'm done with that. I'm going to take a step back, and I'm just going to kind of accept the circumstances that have happened to me and accept the things that are going on. And I meet people like this all along the way, and I used to live like this. God, I'm just going to, you know, whatever happens, happens, and I'll deal with it as I deal with it. And pretty kind of laissez-faire to what was happening in my life. But I've started noticing the people that excel in faith don't just sit back or as some people say, let go and let God, uh, which I understand the premise, and the premise is indeed good. Don't control things. Put control in God's hands. The problem with let go and let God is, God, I'm going to hand that to you, and then you take it from there, bro. I'm just going to do my life. And we walk away from that, and God's like, no, I, I want this to be something that is reciprocated. I want this to be one that, that we are in this together, that this isn't some kind of dictatorship. This is a relationship. And I want you to be an active participant. And so I wrote down this question to myself, what in my life, and so I'll ask it to you, what in your life would be different if you chose to be proactive? What in your life would look different if you chose to be proactive in the way that God designed you, in the hope that he has for you? in the love and care that he calls you to be for other people. I was uh, sitting around with some other people yesterday, and so uh, when I had moments where I was just alone uh, with me and another person, this, uh, you know, there were a lot of people around, but just you know, conversation one-on-one, -on -one, say, hey, and I asked people, like, hey, what would change if you were, ask this question, more proactive? And one person said, Man, I think my marriage would look totally different. So what do you mean? Like, I think we would be healthier. I think we would make choices not based on jobs, but that we'd make choices based on what's best for our family. I was like, man, that's awesome. Another person said, I think our kids, while they might be unhappy initially, would be way better off later, which is usually every parent's thing. Like, if I really laid down the hammer at first and put the boundaries in place, they might be mad, but after a while, like, they would get and be healthy and move and breathe in such a better way. And, they're, and I said, well, why aren't you proactive? I said, well, sometimes I'm just scared that I don't want my kids to just, like, revolt against me, and so I have a hard time, like, doing I said, I know, I get it. I get that. That's really hard. And I started asking these conversations. Went, Man, then what holds us back? What holds us back from making those choices to honor God in those ways and to be proactive? I think for a lot of it is we are trying to move through this and something happens and we can't see the final thing that's going to take place. And so that, because that final thing, if I have faith, I'm not quite sure which direction that's going to go when I've encountered this problem. And if I move in fear and just be about myself, I actually still, and we talked about last week, that either way is still asking us to believe and walk down a road that we're not sure about. And so we encounter these things and we can't, see it. And I'm always reminded of this verse in Hebrews where the writer writes, says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for in the assurance about what we do not, what? See. 
assurance about what we don't see. There's going to be plenty of instances where you're not able to see what's around the corner at that next juncture. But are you and I going to embrace what God designed for us? Because if we're going to stand firm, we're going to say, man, how is my heart? How is my mind with him? It's part of our bigger story that God designed us for. And the reality is this. Everyone has a story. And the pages are blank, which is beautiful news for some of us. They would just be like, eh, for some of us, we're like, oh, I have no clue how to write. I don't know how it's going to go. And here's what happens. You will either choose the narrative or someone will write it what? For you. Someone will write it for you. I encountered this with a family that came a few years back when we moved into the building. When they came, uh, they were what I call de-churched. And I want to explain that definition. For some of you, might be like, de-churched, what does that mean? People, that, and this is like the normal narrative that transpires here with families as we watch the church grow, is that they encountered church younger. They, when they went as kids, they went as young adults, and then we hit like our 20s where we are grown, right? Those of you guys who are like past your 20s, you know, like you know everything. Nobody can tell you nothing. Like you just do it. And then you get older, you think you everything's right. And then you get older, you're like, I didn't know anything. Nothing was right. And we do it. And like slowly we learn, like, man, there was a lot to learn there. And there's this moment where we engage faith. We get in this de-churched kind of mode. This is a family that I met. They came, and it had been a long time since they had been. And they came, and they, you know, things were going on in their family life. And they had some kids, and they're you know, dealing with the, the obstacles of kids and raising them and some of the, the idiosyncrasies that is like that parent is so hard. You know, marriage, relationships, friendships, these things are hard. And as they, as they began to engage they're like, we'd hit these roadblocks in conversation. We'd say, hey, how are you doing? Like, God, you, you're here, and God, like, wants to help move you along. And we're like, oh, I can't do that. Like, why? And we kept butting up against some of their past experience. And a lot of it dealt with shame and just being not good enough, that just guilty, feeling awful. And so when we hit up with the marriage stuff, well, you know, I'm just, I'm not that good. And I don't know why God, whatever. I'm like, who told you that? And I'm like, well, in all during that de-church time, they were still making decisions and all these things. But what we were starting to peel back was that they kind of had just let someone else write their story. And they were accepting what was happening to them instead of being proactive in how God designed them to be. And as we started unpeeling back these things, like, no, you are valued by God. No, you can have an amazing marriage. Yeah, you can help guide your kids. Yeah, whatever, you know, Grandma and Aunt Gertrude and all these other people told you about faith that you're angry about, I want to let you know that stuff's not true, that God has a better plan for you. We started peeling back these layers, and I get a phone call one day, hey, I want you to come over. We're going to celebrate. We're going to cook out. We're going to get baptized at our pool and baptized the husband, the husband baptized the wife, some other people got baptized that day, and we started watching this turn that happened. They started serving and getting connected. At first, when they came, we're like, hey, you know, you could help out and serve. Like, mm -mm, we ain't going to do that. We're not going to. And I'm like, why don't I serve? And they're like, people. That's why I'm like, I get it. People are weird. And, I'm like, and so, but then they started serving. They started leading a small group. And they watched as the, the changes in their kids, especially their youngest one, began to shift. And now I look at them and I go, man, that is a picture when someone begins to choose God to not just accept their terms and write the narrative that God has for them. And this is what the difference was. If you want to know what's the difference maker in standing firm towards God or receiving that stuff and wanting to follow faith but doing your own thing. And the difference is this. The difference between good intentions and good actions is a daily choice to what? Move. To actually engage faith. To say, I'm not going to sit idly by and let, and I want to encourage you guys who have had hangups. This is something that came up yesterday at the, the baptism that we had. They said, man, for, they came for three years. And I said, how come you didn't get baptized sooner? And they response. I had so much hang up about my previous engagement with faith that it kept me from actually moving forward. I want to encourage many of you here this morning who have some baggage from past experience. When we don't move forward because of what happened with someone else and the way they spoke to us and the things they said about us and the things they made us believe, what we've essentially said is, you are now my ruler 
you have power over my future trajectory because of what you did in the past. And I want to encourage you that God has so much more in store for you. For you guys who have claimed faith and have moved in that, but you felt stagnant, you felt a little idle, you felt a little bit like you're not good enough. I don't want you to, for a second, believe that wherever you find yourself, that God cannot grab you and love you and care for you and bring you back to where you were at first. He is so good. And everything that is happening in you, because a healthy faith, here's what I know, a healthy faith moves and motivates. If you're a believer this morning, you might be like, I feel like I'm moving. How many people around you have started to want to engage their faith because of you? Because God is moving through your life. Because God is making a difference through your life. Because if you're a believer and no one around you is ever getting motivated to want to actually follow Jesus, then you may not be actually following and being an example of Jesus daily. And I know that's hard to hear. But maybe just maybe we need to hear it to spur us on to be the type of people that help others. If you go, man, I'm trying to live like Jesus, but all the people I know around me all love Jesus too, then you're not doing it right. Because God didn't call you to a holy huddle. He called you to go and be light to other people, to bring hope to the hopeless, to bring light to the darkness, to go and be for people what you had is someone came to you. And they showed you Jesus, and it took your life. That's why our globe's upside down, because he, they came with the love of Jesus and took your world and flipped it. And you've never been the same. And for some of us this morning, we just need to go, you know what, I'm not going to let that hold me back anymore. I'm going to trust him. For some of us this morning, we go, I know what it's like back there, and I've made this choice, but I don't always act like it, but I'm going to now. And nobody can make that choice for you. That choice, that choice is yours. But what will you choose? Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info. And there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then.